scripture memory verse tonight, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 29, 25. Anybody else? Where is it at? I forgot it. Yes. Proverbs 29, 25. Good. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Where is it at? Uh, Proverbs 29, 25. Uh -huh. Good job, Rita. Yeah, what I, I, I like for people to say the address and then the verse and then say the address again, and it helps you remember where it's at. You don't have to say it to other people. But you can if you would like. But it helps you remember where it's at. Because I think it's, it's somebody says, well, where's that at in the Bible? You should be able to open your Bible and show it to them. Or find it somehow. Now we have a phone in our pocket. We can do search engines. We can do lots of things. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you might not have a signal. You might not have it. But I just like to be able to know the address. I think it's very important to know where it's at. And uh, Anybody else? Proverbs 29.25. Fear a man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Proverbs 29, 25. Good job. Anybody else? Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord uh, shall be saved. Proverbs 29, 25. Good, Good job. job, Ray. Thank you. Bringeth a snare. You know, it's interesting. I just want to show you off the top. I mean, the Proverbs are written, pithy statements, lots of wisdom. Why has this man ever uh, lived um, that wasn't God? Solomon uh, either wrote or compiled all of them. And they're really written in a couple different ways. One is parallelisms. In other words, you know, I have one line, and then the next line will reinforce it by saying the same thing a different way. And then there's contrasting statements. And so now you have, which I see as a contrast, the fear of man bringeth a snare, a trap, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. But notice this, in the contrast, notice that it doesn't say, I want you to notice this, it doesn't say the fear of man brings a snare, but the fear of the Lord makes one safe. Notice it doesn't use the word fear in the second line in the contrast because the word for the fear of the Lord is a totally different word which is talking about reverence it's talking about uh, uh, reverencing God and obeying him really the fear of the Lord if you fear God you will obey him fear of man is different and it means to be frightened or to be even it can even be to care for something in the New Testament type of this we have in um, Philippians 3 6 and 7 is that right or is it 4, 6 and 7 be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your request known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus um, I thought I had it in my notes I don't see it anywhere here I can look really quickly. Uh, but in Philippians, four. it's 4, 6, and 7, isn't it? Yeah. And and the word be anxious in the King James actually is careful for nothing. And, 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 and this word here for fear is harada, harada, H-A-R-A-D-A in the Hebrew. Harada, and it means to, to fear or anxiety, or it can even be care or concern, and it can also be used for quaking or trembling, obviously a fear that way, but, but it, it, when you look at it in the sense of fear, it's caring about, so I mean the simplest form of this could be peer pressure, where you have peer pressure, where everybody is in the woke culture, and if you don't join the woke culture, you are now going to become death culture. You're going to become cancel culture. And so that's the fear that we have here that man uses against us. 
and it produces a snare. And what's the snare? Not to believe God, not to trust God, not to look to God in confidence and be safe with God. We want to join the group. We want to be part of the crowd. We talked about before that, uh, I forget what it was. There's a classroom with about 30 students in it. And they used the, uh, they, they said uh, two and two is five. And everybody knew except for one boy. And by the time they finished, since everybody else said it was five, he joined in and said it was five because he didn't want to be left out. He doesn't, he doesn't want to feel like the odd man out. And so we want to understand that the fear isn't always like I'm afraid of them. I'm trembling. I'm quaking. But it can be caring about being part of the group. It can be caring about joining in and being with everybody else and not being left out. And so that's a big fear with us is that we want to belong to the club. We want to be in the know. We want to be with the king and the princes. Notice there's a follow-up line here. There's a follow-up line here, the next verse. Actually, both of the next two verses. But I just want you to look at verse 26 because this is what many do. Many seek the ruler's favor. Many seek man's favor. Look at it. That's what the ruler is. He's a man. Mm -hmm. But judgment or justice, New King James, for man comes from the Lord. See, we want to seek the Lord. We want to trust in the Lord. We want to be looking to the Lord. We don't want to be afraid and be snared, caught in a trap, listening and knowing that we're following a lie because everybody else is doing it and we don't want to be the odd man out. It's okay to be the odd man out. It's okay to follow truth if nobody else does. And you're the only one that's going to follow truth. And you're the only one that's going to stand for Jesus. It's okay. When you look in the Bible, you see that. Jeremiah preached for 40 years. He was the only one. He never had a convert. Nobody ever listened to him. Nobody ever followed him. He wanted to give up, but he never gave up because of God encouraging him to keep going. And so there's a fear. There's peer pressure. And we don't have to do, you don't have to go much further from that. Just the peer pressure uh, can cause harm to you. You know, I, I wrote in my notes here a few things. Um, one is fear of others is not trusting God. That's what we want to see in this line here. That when you fear man, you're not trusting God. So you're not safe anymore because now you're standing on sand. But when you trust God, you're standing on the rock. You're building on the rock. But when you begin to worry about man and what they think, become a man pleaser, you won't stand on anything that's solid. You move your target all the time because you're trying to please the next man and the next man and the next man because of the peer pressure, because of the fear, because of caring. And we got to be careful because, you know, we've been trained... We've been trained to listen to the voice of the news, the voice of the government, the voice of reason that they call reason. I even heard this today, the voice of logic, what they say it's logical. Do you know the word logical comes from logos, which is the word for Jesus being the living word, the logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. That's where logic comes from. Because he's wisdom, he's logic, and it's illogical not to listen to him and trust him. So the earth, these earthly, central, demonic wisdom of people, they want you to fear them, and they control you with fear. God, can, God wants us to follow his love. God wants to follow us just to follow his good shepherd. He wants us to follow the one that would lay down his life for his sheep. But they want to make you afraid. So now we've got everything from COVID to war to nuclear war. We've got everything going on from, from food lines. Listen to me. The, oh, the food lines and there's not going to be an inflation. All of this is fear of man so that you will get your eyes on the physical battle and you won't trust the Lord and be safe. You are safe in the beloved. Listen to me. We are perfectly safe. And that's what salvation means, to be brought back into the safety of the Lord's house, to be brought back in safely by the kinsman redeemer who died for us. 
He laid down his life for us. And if you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you shall be safe. You shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But see, the enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to go around the back of your house and set it on fire and then run around front and knock on the door and go, here, here's a can of gasoline. Pour it on there. We'll take care of it. That's what the enemy always wants to do. He starts a fire. The devil has got us in sin. He came down and, and caused uh, uh, Eve, Adam and Eve to not trust God. They feared that something was being left out, that God was holding on, and they chose to go after what they were missing when they weren't missing anything. They had the perfect God that they had perfect fellowship with. But in their own hearts, they thought they were missing something. So now they didn't trust God, and they began to trust another voice, and that's how you and I inherited sin, their unbelief, their failure to just trust God that he's enough. God is enough. God has perfectly provided everything for us. He came down to get us, to redeem us, to bring us back into right standing with him. He gives it to us freely, and yet we don't trust him fully. We want to listen to what? The bad news. Listen, God has brought his love and his good news, the euangelion, good news of salvation and redemption, atonement, that we can be at one again with him and his family. And what's the world giving us for fear? It's all bad news. It's all bad news. But that's what we want to be involved with. We live to tell another story. We live to talk about what's going on over there and what's here. We want to fight in these physical battles when he's told us to stand. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand and hand out the spoils of the storehouse. We don't have to get up and fight in this physical battle. You stand and see the salvation of the Lord. And yet everybody wants to be deceived into following the bad news. See, that's the fear of man. It produces a snare. What are you doing way over there when you should be sharing the gospel over here? How can you be led by the Spirit, following the Spirit, being led by the Good Shepherd, talking about the things you're supposed to be talking about when all you want to talk about is the bad news? Don't you know that the counters are going to be empty and that they're coming and they're going to get us and they're going to take it and they're going to do this. Oh my goodness, they're fighting a war over there. Where, where, where was the good news in that? I mean, if you get to Psalms 2 and that God is laughing at them in derision, if you get to the gospel sometime, that's good. But we're supposed to be here as witnesses sharing the good news that Jesus Christ has come and died for us. And all we get caught up is in this snare. We're like birds caught in a snare. and We can't get our leg out. And we want to talk about all this physical stuff. And we don't want to share the hope of Jesus. We want to talk about all this physical. Oh, woe is me. And I don't have enough, and I can't get enough, and I'm afraid, and I don't want to go out of my house. And I have to have 12 guns, or I'm going to be... Where's the trust of the Lord? Where's the trust? Are you safe or are you not safe? Are you okay or are you not okay? Listen, if you listen to bad news, don't be surprised if that's where you're fighting at. If, you, if you're on the front lines of the, the physical battle, thinking that somehow that we're going to win people's souls by fighting a physical battle in the streets... Jesus already won all the souls. All they got to do is believe it. But they, how can they believe it if they don't hear? And how can they hear unless we take them the gospel? And yet the church is silent. The church is out there arguing over CRT and, and, and Black Lives Matter and, and gender uh, fluidity. They're not out there talking about the gospel. We already know the world is in peril. We already know they're dying and going to hell. What is the snare of your soul this morning? What is the snare of your soul today? What is snaring you? What are you caught up in that man has got you fearing that you think you can't trust God about? Because the fear of man, even if it's just care of peer pressure, even if it's just care of losing your job, even if it's just fear that you might be canceled, what snare 
is going on in your life? What is bringing that snare? What fear bringeth it? It, it yields. Listen, so this is common, and I see it everywhere, and, and, and I'm seeing it more and more, is that it's just the common rule that God has put in the universe. You reap what you sow. If you are afraid of man, very true. If you're afraid of man, it's going to yield. It brings. That's what the word means. It means yields, or it can cause to suffer, or it can cause you to receive what you're very much fearing. Do you remember what happened with the Tower of Babel? <clears throat> Nimrod and them. They said, "Come, let us build a tower, lest we're scattered across the whole earth." What happened when they began to do it out of fear? of being scattered, Nimrod tricked them into making them and said, fear also, if you don't make me bricks and build this dagger not, I'm going to kill you. And then what happened? God said, let's go down there and scatter them before they kill themselves. And in his grace, he scattered them. And in his grace, he protected them. And in his grace, he allowed them to go and move them to other places so that in their union, they didn't kill themselves and be found fighting against God. And the very thing that they were afraid of became the snare that caused them to be separated from each other. And that's what's going on in the church today. The devil divides us through fear. Instead of us surrendering and meeting with God, getting into the word, prayer, and fellowship, allowing the Holy Spirit to show us our gifts, talents, and ability, and settling into the place that God created us to be, and beginning to do the work of the ministry together, we have these snares that keep us out of fellowship, keep us out of church. They keep us separated because we're chasing the physical. We're trying to find the king's favor instead of the favor of God. We're looking for the favor of the world and looking to finish our career and looking to do things that make us look like we're keeping up with the Joneses. Who wants to run headlong into hell? Hell's going to be full of Joneses. And I'm not referring to anybody's specific name. That's the cliche, keeping up with the Joneses. When you're chasing the world and you're doing that because you're snared by fear that you're not keeping up and you don't have the next gadget and your kids ain't going to make it into an Ivy League school and all of these things that lead us straight to hell. But I would encourage you, I would encourage you to trust the Lord. To be led by him, as he says in uh, John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Who are you following? The fear of man brings a snare. But whoever trusts, notice how it's open door, anyone, whoever, whomsoever, just like the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, whomsoever, shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So a fear of man, unbelief towards God. Is it unbelief towards God? Because if, if fear of other men or other things is not trusting God, then fear of man would be unbelief toward God. Because that's the voice we should be hearing. That's the voice we should be listening to and following. That's the plan of salvation we should be pursuing. It, it's not anything else. But we should be in the word, prayer, and fellowship, asking the Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, and we should be testing the spirits because you could be following the wrong spirit leading your life and say, oh, it's okay, I'm doing good. And it's all because of fear of man. And it's not actually because of trusting the Lord. A snare is a noose for catching animals. And, you know, it's interesting that... <laughs> It's interesting that if you step in a snare, 
You don't know it's till it's too late. You're, you're, you're fearing man, and it's bringing the snare, and you're walking towards the snare, you're walking towards the trap, and you're in the trap before you know you're in the trap. And it's too late now. You know, that's why they hide them. They put, they put foliage on them, and they camouflage them, and all of a sudden you're hanging upside downward. Or all of a sudden you're dead and you fell into a pit. All of a sudden it's too late. But today is the day for salvation. It's a hook for the nose. A hook for the nose. To lead you away from God. It's a trap. And man wants you always to follow them. Not to follow Jesus. We got all kinds of rock star pastors out here today. And I'm sorry, I'm not picking on God's true church. They want you to follow their plan. They want you to follow what God's telling them. And, and, and when you do that in allegiance to a man, it becomes a snare. You have to do that trusting the Lord. And if that man can't listen to your counsel about the word of God, then it becomes a trap. And that man is not listening to God. If he can't listen to counsel and pray about it and in a multitude of counsel wage war and he can't stand before you and admit his faults and admit his pride and admit that he has mistakes, there's a problem. And you might be following just a natural man who is quenching the spirit, although he talks about the word of God. Be very careful about the snare because the trap is too late. The spirit of Antichrist has already been let out and people are in apostasy. We see it happen in the Old Testament. We see it happen with the Jewish nation. We see the disgust as we read it and we go, what were they thinking? Why would they treat their own people that way? Why would they do this to Jesus? Because they were men pleasers. There was peer pressure. Because it brung the snare and it was too late. But God already knew it. And then he hung on a cross and he died for us. He wasn't killed by us. He gave up his spirit. He laid down his life. He became a willing sacrifice. A living sacrifice that said, I surrender my spirit to you. He humbled himself even to the point of death. Death on a cross for you and me. Because he was obeying the Father's plan perfectly. He wasn't following men. He wasn't being led by lying men. And the spirit of this age, he was led by the spirit of God to do the will of God for the glory of God. And we need to learn from these examples or in our fear, we'll be in a snare ourselves. We'll be in a trap. Listen, how do you get rid of that fear? You build your relationship with God. You learn that he's a trustworthy God. When you get into the word, these things are written as examples for, for us. So that the end of the age is coming upon. We see who God is. We see his character, his nature, his will. We see what he's doing. We know he's a trustworthy God that never changes. And so build that relationship that is consistent in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. It's consistent, not because, oh, I'm in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. You can search the Scriptures and not find Jesus. But when you found Jesus and you're trusting Jesus, you need to know that His character is already written down in a book. 66 books by 40 authors of his character of what he does in love and mercy and grace and yes in judgment to those who turn from him and disobey him and don't want to follow him we need to learn to fear God and the fear of God is obedience it comes out in obedience obedience and reverence well obedience is reverence yes why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? Mm -hmm. See, that's reverence. You're calling him kurios, supreme in authority, but then I don't want to do what he says. That's not honoring him. That's not reverencing him. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy um, 17. I think. I can tell you that my mind still isn't working right, but my spirit is good. It is well with my soul. So I want you to see this. You know, Revelation, um, 
1 6 says that we are kings and priests of our God. And this is a text. It's Deuteronomy 17. And we're going to start in verse 14. And just going to, I'm going to just going to read to it really quick. I'm not going to keep you long tonight. Uh, but I do want you to understand that when we look at man, when we fear man, when we just all our life is looking for the favor of man and we're wanting to be pleasing to man, you can't be pleasing to God. You want to please God first. And we want to learn uh, to trust God. But sometimes we're trusting God and we don't even know what we're, who He is. We need to understand His unchanging character and nature and that He loves us so much that He would die on a cross for us. He would become a man. Think about it, because I was thinking about it today, and just, you know, it's one thing when we suffer, because we will go through suffering. Too much suffering shall we enter the kingdom of God. We will suffer, but we are sinners. And if anybody tries to say they're not a sinner, then God would call them a liar. And that's the first part of sinning. If you have not sinned, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. Listen to me. Jesus was perfect. We can't even comprehend. We can't even comprehend. Now, I know there's people that's been falsely accused, and they, they knew they were innocent, and they knew they didn't do it. And, and I know they went through, um, you know, some horrific things. Maybe it was 60 years in prison. That would be horrific for an innocent man to be 60 years in prison. But we're talking about a God with us, Emmanuel, innocent, never did anything, came down for this purpose, anointed to die for us, innocent, beaten for us, nailed to a tree, and died for us. That's more than 60 years in prison. Nobody has ever suffered this way. It just blows my brain to think about it. That, that he would die for us. That's how much he loves us. You can trust a God that would lay down his life for you like that. Yeah. You can trust him. He's here to redeem us. He's following a plan that would put us in eternity with him forever, worshiping and being in his presence as his friends. He's not trying to hurt us. He's for us. He's not against us. He's done everything to bring us back in. His banished ones back in to fellowship with him. And yet the devil tricks us, man tricks us through their snare. They bring this snare where we think God is mad at us. Oh, I just thought a bad thought. God's mad at me. He already paid for that bad thought. Deal with that bad thought. Fight that bad thought. Say, God, I need help with this bad thought. But he's not trying to judge you for that bad thought or punish you for it. But you need to deal with it. You need to fight that sin by surrendering to him. By not listening to men who make up plans and psychology and sociology and every type of program and religion to get you away from God. It's a snare. It's a trap. It's a lie. It's God who loves us. It's God who we should be trusting in. And we should be spending time with him, not for salvation, but because of salvation. He is the light that leads us out of a dead, dark world. He is the light that leads us away from the fowler's trap. He is the light that shined in the darkness, and we should be proclaiming his praises. So here in 14 in Deuteronomy, Moses speaking, and he says, or excuse me, 17, 14, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, listen, key word, God owns it all. He's given it to you. Listen, he didn't have to come down here and die and give you anything. He wants to give it to you. He wants you to have an inheritance. He wants you to be back in fellowship with him. He wants you to meet with him. He's always waiting for you to meet with him. And possesses it. You're there and you're possessing it and you begin to dwell in it. You're standing there and you say to them, this was the land of Canaan. To you and I, it's our relationship, understanding our inheritance, understanding that we're citizens in heaven, understanding that this is not our home. And say, this is what they will say. We're going to set a snare over us. Oh, I mean, I, I said king, didn't it? I'm sorry. Um, this is what, when they come into the land, 
Isn't it, isn't it amazing how Moses is sitting here telling them the future before it even happened because God is using him and speaking through him and telling him what to say to the children of Israel because God is outside of time. He already knows that they're going to get uh, um, caught in this snare and want a king. And they, I will set a king over me. This is what I will do. Notice that. I will, not God will. It never entered God's mind to give them a king until they asked for it. But he knew they was going to ask for it. He was their king. It was a theocracy. He wanted them to follow him and to trust him and to love others because, they lo because he first loved us. I will set a king over me, snare. Listen, if the government's over you, it's a snare. It's a trap. You're not trusting God. Not fully. Because you're trusting in the government. Like what? Oh, that's the witness of the other nations. The Gentiles. Because he's speaking to the Jews. So the Gentiles, the unbelievers, those that are serving false gods, they want to be like them. There's the snare. You and, I mean, it's the same thing as keeping up with the Joneses. Want to be like all the nations around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. King Jesus. Who did he choose? King Jesus. David is a type. They chose Saul first. That was a king after their own heart. Oh, I know God picked him out. But he wanted to show them what a king with their heart would do. And then he come back and he showed them a king with his heart, the one he chose. One from among your brethren, you shall set his king over you. He had to become our brethren. He had to be flesh to become our kinsman redeemer. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses. That's his own strength. Solomon did that for himself. Nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, go back to the world. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. What's the snare to your soul today? What keeps you from trusting the Lord and going out and telling everybody to repent? What keeps you from being concerned about souls? What keeps you from being a living sacrifice that's being transformed? Listen, when you're a living sacrifice that's being transformed by the renewing of the mind, I guarantee you, you'll be a witness. But when you're being conformed to this world and keeping up with the Joneses, you're only being worried about yourself. You're worried about your career. The world doesn't go you're by following. what they say. They go by what they see. Uh, yeah, we're walking uh, by sight, not by faith. Yeah. That's a good point, right? And that's what the person who's being conformed to earthly, central, demonic wisdom and has stepped into the snare and is reaping what they've sown will do. But someone who's being transformed will put aside their own life, living sacrifice. They understand that they're holy because he is holy. And they're focused on God's plan, not on their own plan. They're not trying to multiply their own strength, their own horses. You already trust in the living God who has all strength. Why would you need any more strength from anywhere else? Why would you want to go back to Egypt for help and go to their earthly, central, demonic wisdom, go to their programs, go to their Bible-based programs? I get in trouble for that. But if it's Bible-based, then it means it's got the world in it. It's got some horses in it. It's got some poop in the brownie. The Bible's enough. We don't need these programs. I'm sorry. It's a snare. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. Why? Why would you not want to multiply women and wives? Or his heart will turn away. That's what happens when you have to take care of many wives. It's hard enough to take care of one wife. And 
even Paul said, if you can remain single, remain single. Why do so many of them have so many wives? Uh, they would marry foreign kings, other kings as daughters, so that they would, because their reasoning was, is the foreign king would never invade or attack them with their own child there. That's one reason. The other reason is the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I mean, there's it many things Solomon that we can do that the world does and that God will not even speak. Wives. Excuse me? Solomon. How many wives did he have? Uh, 300 wives and 700 300 concubines. Wives, that's what I thought. And, and there's many things that God will allow, but they're not good. We're free to do lots of things, but they're not good for us. All things are lawful, but they're not profitable for our transformation into the image of God. They hinder us. They become a trap to our soul. So he wasn't supposed to multiply wives, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver or gold for himself, earthly riches. Also, and this is really what I was bringing you to, because I wanted you to understand uh, the fear of the Lord. Uh, even though it's not used, it's, it's trusting the Lord. Uh, we want to know about the difference between the two fears. Also, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. It's my daily bread that he may what? Learn to fear the Lord his God, and to be careful, here's what you're fearing, to be careful to observe all the word of this law and these statutes. Why? That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of those governed by God, Israel. So the point being to be in the word, prayer, and fellowship so that we can learn who God is and we can learn to fear and we can see the examples of those who have gone before us who did right and wrong and we can learn to do what we're supposed to do. That fearing man becomes a snare. It's a trap to your soul. You will reap it if you live it, you will reap it. But he who trusts in the Lord will be safe. That's where judgment comes from. And one would say, like in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear the Lord, or excuse me, do not fear them that can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But fear him who can cast both the body and the soul into hell. That's the one we're supposed to fear. So the fear of man brings a snare. But whoever batak, trust, it's the, it's the word for having confidence in. It's uh, to hide for refuge. We had this, do we have it in the last one? Is that what we did last time? When did we do Proverbs? Oh, Proverbs 3, 7. Uh, Batak was in uh, 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And it means to hide for refuge, to trust, to be confident or sure about, to be bold in, to put your hope in, to put your confidence in the Lord, Jehovah, the self-existing one, the one who has came to save us. We want to put our trust in in him, and then we will be safe. And, and, and it actually says, shall be safe. Shall be saved is Romans 10, 10. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Here it shall be safe. Um, and 
the interesting thing is it means to be inaccessible. Once you're trusting in the Lord, you're inaccessible to any of the wiles of the devil, any of the traps. He's going to guard you. You're safe, you're strong, you're exalted, you're excellent, you're set on high. You're safely protected. If you back up a couple pages, 1923, one of my favorite scriptures, I like them all, one of my favorite scriptures, the fear of the Lord is life. And he who has it will abide in satisfaction. Listen, he will not be visited with evil. It's inaccessible when you trust in the Lord. What verse is that, Pastor? It's 1923. Proverbs 19:23. The fear of the Lord, the word of the Lord is clean, it's pure, it's enduring. Who are you trusting in? So are you saying that Satan won't bother you if you're deeply rooted? He can't. You're saying he can't. He can't. So your trouble that you have... He can for the being allowed to. You have to give him permission. You have to give him permission by believing the lie and give him access to your life. No, if you're... He has no power over you anymore. He's defeated. So your troubles are just normal, everyday. It's just life. life. Reaping what you sow, stepping into the snare. No, no. Our no, battle no is... Or our, whatever. Huh? We all have them. Everybody. It rains and shines on the just and the unjust. Right. You know? Yeah. It's life. And our witness is, is how we go through it. Uh, We're not saying Satan doesn't exist. We're not saying that evil doesn't exist. But in fact, evil is the absence of God. When you take God out and the trust of God in the equation, when you have unbelief, that's how we inherited our sin nature, is they took God out of it. They were walking with him daily. They decided they would do their own thing, and they removed God and their trust in God and listened to another voice. Yes, Satan's there. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to diminish the fact that he's there, but our battle's not with him. Our battle is to surrender to the Lord and trust the Lord and walk in belief of what God has already done in our life and tell others about it. But what we do is we want to look at man and listen to man and follow men's programs, and it's a snare to our lives. When things happen in our life, we don't go, oh, woe is me. We say, what do I do now, Lord? What is, what's the wisdom in this? What am I? Because he works all things out for good for those who love him and are called according to their purpose. He's working it out in us and through us, and he's doing his perfect way. Does it hurt? Yes. But nobody has suffered the way his son has suffered. Nobody suffered. He took it all for us. And, and, and this is going to be nothing compared to the glory that we'll have when we're with him. But so often we're deceived into thinking that the enemy is still destroying our life. And as my Bible study, Mike Abney used to say, he said, I get up in the morning and I go, I found the enemy. And he'd look in the mirror and he'd go, no, no, no. It's the decisions we make. It's, it's believing God or not believing God. It's following God or not following God. He's a light to our, our lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And, and the Spirit of God is protecting us and sealing us, but He gives us free will to make choices that can hurt and harm. So we're on our own worst enemies. We give the devil permission. Right. right. We give the world permission to bring a snare. Now listen, this is not to say anything about the pain that we might. Listen, if you choose to follow God and you speak, choose to speak up about God and then the pain comes and the suffering comes and the persecution comes, that's there also. But it's because they hated him, not us. They hate you being a witness to a great and mighty God. They hate you speaking and shining light into their darkness, but you don't have anything to say other than his word. You don't have anything to witness about other than his works. 
You don't have anything of our own except for the blood of Jesus that bought us. The enemy, yes, he's there, but he, when, I'm inaccessible unless I give him access. When I'm trusting in the Lord, walking in the Spirit, living in belief of God and doing what he's called me to do, that's why I'm always trying to encourage people, find it out and walk in it. Pursue him. Get into the word. Just because you get people into a building, you can get thousands and thousands of them into a building that's called a church. And they're nothing but tares that say they believe. The first word of the gospel is repent. And unless there's repentance, belief has nothing to do with it. The demons believe and tremble, but they're not repenting. Turning is the evidence. Transformation is the evidence of who you believe, who you trust in, and who you're living for. And nobody does it perfectly. That's why we had Christ do it perfectly for us. So that now we're inaccessible to the enemy unless we give him access. We have, there's no more penalty. It's called double jeopardy in law. He already paid for it, so we can't be punished for it. There's no condemnation, Romans 8, 1, to those who are in Christ Jesus if we walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. The problem is this stuff isn't being taught in the church. What we want to do is give them a program. Come and do this for a while and follow this and, and do hopscotch in these boxes. And then when you get done with that, you'll know how. That's not discipleship. That's programming and indoctrination. That's not teaching somebody to fall in love with, listen for the voice of, and know the character and nature and will of this God who loved us and died for us. It has to be that personal relationship that comes out in trusting him. That he really has done this. He really has saved us. He really has paid our debt. And I really have no condemnation anymore. That gives me great boldness. It gives me great, beautiful feet to go out and preach the gospel with. I don't have to stand in the shame of my sin because I have beautiful feet that have been cleaned. And they're being cleaned every day by Christ. We're going to get to that in John 13 eventually. That's why it's so important. You don't read the word for salvation. You read the word to find out what this salvation is who this God is, what kind of love is this that would die for us? And it doesn't add one single thing to him. But we fear man. Wait a minute, we have all these systems and these PhDs and we have all these things and we have all these programs, we have all this and look what's going on in the world. Ah, ah, ah. And he, the same thing Peter did. When he was trusting Christ, if it's you, bid me to come to you. And he stepped right out of the boat and stood on the water. But then he heard boom, the crack of the lightning. And he goes, wow, what am I doing? And he began to see the world. And in unbelief, he began to sink. And what happened? Jesus had to save, save me, Lord. And the Lord grabbed him and put him in the boat. And he was teaching him that he could walk on water. If he trusts in him. He doesn't have to fall for the snare of man. He doesn't have to look at the physical and live according to the physical because this is not our home. There's so many people I don't think know the truth. Truth is a person. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I, I have the way, the truth, and the life. But so many people in so many churches Getting no one Jesus. comes to the Father They're except not getting there. Because Jesus is the rabbi that's supposed to be teaching them. Yeah. Spirit. And until they actually know truth, the person can't be taught. Nope. <coughs> it's so like sad. Roman, Romans 8 talks about yeah. it. Yeah, it's so, so sad. And so there's the churches. I, I, I used to, when I was first born again, I would say, man, they must not be teaching truth. But it's not always true that they're not teaching truth. They can be teaching truth and the heart receiving it hasn't got fertile ground and letting it grow. That's what Michael just said, by the way. I was just breaking it down. 
So the word can be coming out. It can be planted. They get up and they go back out in the cares of the world still in the way. They go back out and it's planted on rock and it doesn't have deep and, it, and, and something else happens and they go and it's all burned up. And then some of them are afraid to preach the truth because of the snare of men. They're trying to keep the people in there because they have a mortgage payment. They have to keep this program alive that hasn't saved a soul ever. And so they have to keep it alive and they don't want to offend the people running it. So they won't preach the truth of the gospel by the spirit of God. And they can see the spirit and they are jealous of the spirit. But they won't stop doing what they're doing because they're afraid instead of trusting God. And so that's how you end up with apostasy. An entire system where Jesus says, well, I even find faith when I come. Because the snare, or excuse me, the fear of man produces a snare. It brings, it's produce, that's what it means. It means to yield. That's the fruit that comes from it. A snare to your soul. But he who trusts in the Lord will be safe. And that's what we want, isn't it? Yes. Safe in Christ. Safe in the Lord. Safe in his house. Safe in this salvation that he's made for us. And man has complicated. All we can do is point them to the word of God. The living word and then the written word. And if they get into this word... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you really want to hear the voice of God as you're in the word of God. And it's everywhere. I know I've been in two kinds of churches. Never knew anything until I came here. I mean, I thought I did. Well, see, that could be you waking up, too. It doesn't have to do it anything with you. years? No, it does sometimes. It does I sometimes. Really have wasted time. It does sometimes. You get into a place. Well, I mean, there's plenty of people that do. You know? Satan can harden our hearts so much. So much. Well, he must have deafened me back then. Uh-huh. I never even heard that stuff. And then with 26, and just quickly, part of the snare is, is you're looking for favor of the ruler instead of the face and favor of God, the Lord. Because that's where judgment's going to come from. He is the one that can cast body and soul into hell. Man can't do that. Oh, they can tell you all kinds of stuff, but they can't do anything except lie to your soul. So next week, next week, uh, I'm going to stay in Proverbs for a while. I love the Proverbs. I might teach them next. I don't know. Proverbs 18.10. Proverbs 18.10. I was reading on the 18th. Proverbs 18.10 says this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. There's our word again. I like the word safe. What verse is that? It's Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into and are safe. And I'll look up the chords to it. It's a song we used to sing when I was first born again. And we did the name of the, how's that go? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into and are safe. Yeah, Tom used to play it all the time. So the kids loved it. The kids loved it. Your mom would get them going on it. So we want to know it's about the name of the Lord, the character, the nature, the will, the authority of God. It's a strong tower. You can trust him. It cannot be torn down. There's no wisdom or counsel against him. He's a trustworthy God that loves us and he's not against us. Proverbs 18.10, write it down, memorize it, uh, and uh, be prepared to share it with somebody. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy and your grace in our life. Lord, help us to see those stumbling blocks, those places that the enemy is causing us to trust in men and not in you, to fear men uh, when he cannot do anything with our souls. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to trust you, Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.